Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm Catherine Ingracia. I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone tonight to our annual lecture sponsored by the Society of the Cincinnati. And deans are not supposed to have favorite lectures, especially as I look at some of our endowed chairs here who have their own sponsored lectures. But I will say globally, the lectures from the history department are among my favorite. And my historian colleagues here will appreciate it. I was with someone the other day, a, a, a grant administrator um, from a, an agency, and we were talking about the 18th century, which happens to be the field in which I work. And he said, oh, are you a historian? And I said, no, I'm a literary historian. To my colleagues in history, that's not a real historian. But I took it as a, a great mark of uh, a great compliment that someone would confuse me with a historian. Uh, we are delighted that the Society of the Cincinnati sponsors this annual lecture. And as uh, Bill uh, Longen, who I'm about to introduce, uh, just said, there has never been a more important time to be a history major or to have lectures that follow on these lines of the mission of the Society of the Cincinnati. Um, one of the reasons why these lectures are so compelling to us every year is because the issues that they raise are ever more timely, right? Whether it's about being an American Democrat, whether it's thinking about the principles that shape the 18th century, of which we are all the heirs, which I can claim as both a literary historian and a historian, or whether we're thinking about what our students are thinking about in their and our faculty in their classrooms, it's never been more timely. And that timeliness and relevance is really the hallmark of the Department of History here at VCU. When I look at the students who graduate from this program and the rigorous curriculum to which they've been exposed, when I look at the quality scholarship of the faculty members who populate our department, and when I look at what our historian made, history majors go on to do and the kinds of lectures that the department as a whole sponsors, it's a real reminder of how vital, how important, and how timely this department is. I want to thank those who were responsible for organizing it, Carolyn Eastman, uh, Bill Langen, who's going to, from the Society of the Cincinnati, and of course, Andrea and Kathleen, who organ make everything possible for everyone here. Um, and so I'm well, ha so happy to welcome you tonight, and I'm now going to toss it to our representative from the Society of the Cincinnati. Didn't that turn out well? I, I just anyway. Um, well, it, it, you all do a terrific job with this lecture. We do this lecture here, University of Richmond, BMI, George Mason, Hampton Sydney, and we are adding WNL. Adding WNL, and and there are a lot of ties to the Society of the Cincinnati to. Washington and Lee University, or what became Washington and Lee University, when the society kind of went out of business in the 1820s, its endowment was given to what became WNL. And today, you can go to the registrar at WNL, and because of that funding, demand a class in artillery science. <laughs> They have to they have to honor that. We think they'd probably outsource it to another organization right down the street. And I don't believe you get any credit for it, but but the but the class is still there. So um real quick, I, I want to make sure everybody in this room is aware of the American Revolution Institute. This is the uh the, the public educational arm of the Society of the Cincinnati. Uh it's been around for about 10 years and um, the best scholarship on this topic in the world for free, 24 hours a day. I don't know if the deal gets any better than that. Uh, so this is our YouTube channel. Uh, there are over 500 programs now uh, going back about nine years in terms of the speakers. A number of the speakers have been speakers at this when they spoke at Anderson House up in Washington. Uh, Maya Jasanoff comes to mind. Andrew O'Shaughnessy comes to mind in terms of some of the ones that are now on the program. Um, it's getting tremendous traction in a way that we weren't prepared for at all. For fiscal year 2022, we had 166,000 views. 
For fiscal year 2023, we had 281,000 views. We went from 35,000 hours of people watching it to almost 80,000 hours of people watching it. So uh, it's over 500 programs um, and the momentum is terrific. And I just want, especially this audience, for you to be aware that this is available to you as a resource. Tonight, right this moment, they're adding another program. Uh, Cynthia Kerner with George Mason is speaking at Anderson House right now uh, on her new book, A Woman and Her Family in Revolutionary America. That's going on this evening. Real quick, the Spurgeon family of North Carolina experienced a cataclysm of the American Revolution in the most dramatic ways from different sides. Jane Wellborn Spurgeon was a patriot who welcomed General Nathaniel Green to her home and aided the Continental Forces. Her husband, well, that would have been a fun Thanksgiving. Her husband was a loyalist and an officer fighting for King George III in the local Tory militia. Drawing from her new book, Dr. Kerner focuses on the wife of a middling backcountry farmer to show how the revolution not only toppled long established political hierarchies, but also strained family ties and drew women into the public sphere to claim both citizenship and rights. That's going on right this minute and will be up on the website very soon. So I just wanted to put in a plug for the ARI if you go to the society the Cincinnati.org, there's a lot about the organization on the website, but this is our public education arm. And I welcome all of you who have an interest to please take advantage of this resource. Thank, thank you very much to VCU for all you do for this program. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's such a pleasure. Welcome. I'm Carolyn Eastman. I'm a member of the uh, faculty in the history department. I study the revolutionary era, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, our 14th annual lecture on the history of the American revolutionary era. Uh, the lecture is sponsored by the Society of the Cincinnati and the state of Virginia. You know, Every year, the Society's generosity makes it possible to invite a scholar whose work on the revolutionary era has the potential to change our thinking. And this year is no exception. I, I especially want to give thanks to the Society because, you know, VCU is not a rich university, and it seems as if every year um, we we just tighten our belts a little bit more. So special events like this one mean so much to all of us as a community, as a place within a much larger community locally. Thank you so much. I also wanna thank Andrea White and Kathleen Murphy in the history department who just, I mean, they just do such a beautiful job. Thank, I can't thank them enough. Um, but tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome Matthew Rainbow Hale to pre present tonight's talk. Originally from Western Massachusetts, Dr. Hale received his PhD at Brandeis Co uh, University and is now Associate Professor of History at Goucher College, where he specializes in the history of America and modern Europe, especially focusing on political history and the history of print and democracy. Um, he's had fellowships at the most prestigious places in the country, the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, the American Antiquarian Society, the New York Historical Society, and on and on. Um, it's also a pleasure to learn that Matthew spent a year here in Richmond as a very young college graduate teaching at a high school in the West End only making it for one year as a as a teacher before heading off to grad school. Um, so now, um, one of my best friends in grad school used to say that the 1790s were the best, it was the best and most interesting decade in American history. And because it was during this decade that an enormous number of Americans tried to come to grips with the meaning of the American Revolution. And they started to ask, what did the revolution mean to ordinary people? 
what could it mean for people at the at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum? And moreover, then many peoples around the Atlantic world also began to ask important questions about what a better world might look like and how non-elite people could have voices in their governments. So Matthew Hale was not the person who advocated the 1790s as the most interesting decade, but I wouldn't be surprised if he agrees because he has done so much to unpack this fascinating period of time in a series of prize-winning and influential pieces of writing and in the much anticipated book he's now completing for the University of Virginia Press, um, he has an, analyzed how the legacy of the American Revolution in concert with the changing nature of the French Revolution influenced Americans thinking about what democracy meant, what popular sovereignty meant, and how many different peoples began to imagine the future of this new American nation. It is often a surprising story, especially regarding Americans' views of the monarchy, uh, considering that many of us grew up sort of sneering at poor King George III. But most of all, it's a story that asks us to reconsider what it meant to be a Democrat more than 200 years ago. So please join me in welcoming Matthew Rainbow Hale to VCU. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Let's see if I can lift this a little bit. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, let me give a special shout out to my sister-in-law, Tish Robertson, for coming. It's great to see you. Let me also give a shout out to some students I see, including some from a class yesterday that I had the honor of visiting, uh, Professor Eastman's class. Um, thank you to Andrea White, I don't know where you went, but um, for all your work and, and the, the library event staff for setting this up, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you to VCU for hosting and supporting this type of event. And thank you especially to Carolyn Eastman and the Society of the Cincinnati uh, for the invitation. It is a real honor and privilege. And sort of echoing what's already been said, it is so heartening to see a commitment to the study of the revolutionary era and to the intellectual life of the university and the public. Okay. Let me begin with a graph. Let me see if I can just arrange this here. Let me begin with a graph that documents an explosion. This graph charts the relative frequency between 1763 and 1795 of American newspaper usage of words associated with democracy. So democracy, democratic, and democrat. What is striking is how infrequently democracy words were used in the years traditionally associated with the American Revolution, roughly 1763 to 1787. And I was planning to have a little, you know, red clicker to show you and highlight it, but apparently the red clickers doesn't show up on this type of screen. So just look closely from 1763 to approximately 1787, there's not much activity. It's relatively infrequently used. There is a slight uptick of democracy words in the late 1780s and early 1790s, but the graph clearly shows that there was a huge surge in democracy words starting in 1793 and continuing in 1794 and 1795. And if we look more closely, we can see that the word Democrat was basically non-existent in American newspapers before 1790. 
In other words, there were no Democrats during the American Revolution. Only in the years 1793 to 1795 did a substantial number of Americans start to self-identify as Democrats. To make sense of this explosion of democratic self-consciousness, I'm going to highlight an inflection point in the history of sovereignty. And here is my big idea for the day. If you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember and wrestle with this idea. The sudden invention of the American Democrat built upon monarchical values, even as it reinforced the formal rejection of monarchy as an institution. Or to put it rather pithily, monarchy is the parent of democracy. Let's consider the idea of sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Samuel Johnson's 1755 dictionary defines sovereignty as supremacy, highest place, supreme power, highest degree of excellence. Notice that this definition is not simply about power. It is also about the moral quality and exalted aura of authority. It is also about the highest degree of excellence. What was meant by excellence? The first definition of excellence in Samuel Johnson's dictionary was the state of abounding in any good quality. So if part of the mystique of sovereignty derives from irresistible power, it also derives from the idea of transcendence and surpassing goodness and honor. Now let's turn to monarchical sovereignty. 16th century French lawyer Jean Baudin wrote the following, because there are none on earth greater than sovereign princes, we must revere their majesty. He who condemns his sovereign prince condemns God whose image he is. This passage underscores the religious underpinnings of monarchical sovereignty. You can't have monarchy without religion. Kings and queens were the very image or reflection of God on earth and were therefore owed reverence. Baudin and other theorists, they understood that monarchs were human and therefore sinful, but they simultaneously characterize monarchs as more than human, as persons endowed with an ineffable majesty and with an essential rather than a behavioral goodness. Monarchs were also viewed as the exclusive center and source of a hierarchical social order oriented toward notions of honor. King Louis XV of France declared that public order in its entirety emanates from me. Thomas Hobbes of England similarly wrote that in the sovereignty is the fountain of honor, the dignities or titles of Lord, Earl, Duke, and Prince are his, the monarch's, creatures. Taken together, these quotations demonstrate that in the same way the sun provides life-giving energy through its rays and arranges the solar system through its gravitational pull, so the monarch animated and organized society. Various historians have shown how pervasive monarchical culture was in colonial British American society. 
to give you just a taste of monarchical culture's strength in early America, let's look at an extraordinary experience relayed by a Philadelphian named Benjamin Rush. In 1768, Rush visited the House of Lords in England. When Rush walked into the chamber and saw the royal throne, he asked if he could sit on it. The guide said, no, you can't. But Rush persisted, and the guide eventually relented. So Rush walked over to the royal throne and sat in it for a considerable time. And this is what he wrote about the experience. When I first got into it, the royal throne, I was seized with a kind of horror, which for some time interrupted my ordinary train of thinking. This, said I, is the golden period of the worldly man's wishes. His passions conceive, his hopes aspire after nothing beyond this throne. This passage shows that in 1768, Benjamin Rush, a future signer of the Declaration of Independence, was thoroughly invested in the mystique of monarchical sovereignty. Rush's encounter with the royal throne was nothing less than an ecstatic religious experience. And it's worth pausing to consider the exact substance of that experience. Monarchical sovereignty rested on the notion of exalted status, on the premise that the king or queen inhabited a realm so lofty that mere mortals like you and me could only dream of it. Yet depictions of the monarch's loftiness ironically stimulated a fixation on what it was like to be so exalted. The huge gap between the exalted monarch and lowly subjects paradoxically encouraged subject, subjects to traverse that gap via their imaginations. Rush's description of his encounter with the royal throne reveals a popular American hunger for the feeling or the experience of sovereignty. And now we come to the American Revolution and popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is actually an ancient concept, but up until the Declaration of Independence, it usually operated in the realm of theory. Immediately before and after the break from Britain in 1776, the idea of the people's supremacy became a matter of practical as well as theoretical concern. In particular, the question of how exactly to institutionalize the people's sovereignty assumed prominence and posed countless difficult questions, such as, if the people are sovereign, are quasi-legal bodies such as committees and conventions the truest representatives of the people? Or are legislatures the truest representatives? Should protests and mobs be viewed as expressions of the people's will, or should they be viewed as violations of the people's will? And who exactly counts as the people? And so on and so on, questions and more questions. Those questions stimulated a complex web of debates and power struggles during the American Revolution. One subset of those debates and power struggles arrived at a relatively durable resolution with the establishment of the Constitution in 1787-88. Now, rather than discuss the particular institutional arrangements set forth, I want us to think about the Constitution in terms of the evolution of sovereignty. On December 4th, 1787, 
Federalist, in other words, pro-Constitution, James Wilson, argued the following in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. The supreme, absolute, and uncontrollable authority remains with the people. The supreme power resides in the people as the fountain of government. On December 11th, 1787, Wilson declared that the general government and the state governments are acknowledged to be so many emanations of power from the people. We've seen this language before. Just like King Louis XV of France, James Wilson used the idea of emanations from the sovereign. And just like Thomas Hobbes, Wilson referred to the sovereign as a fountain. The difference was that the people were now the sovereign, not the king or queen. The American revolutionary struggle to institutionalize popular sovereignty resulted in a federal constitution whose first three words, we the people, helped cement and popularize the idea of the people as the supreme or sovereign authority. Some Americans experienced the ratification of the Constitution as a glorious apotheosis of the people's sovereignty. According to Simon Newman, ratification of the Constitution prompted celebratory gatherings that took place throughout the country in perhaps the biggest display of national unity through festive culture since the Stamp Act crisis of 1765. And in a few of those celebrations of the ratification of the Constitution, people lifted a glass and toasted the majesty of the people or the people of the United States. As far as I can tell, these were the very first toasts to the people in the history of British North America and the US. It is as if the decades long upheavals of the American Revolution culminating in the US Constitution were prompting some individuals to experience the sovereign people as wondrously exalted and therefore worthy of celebratory reverence. It is tempting to end the story here with the Constitution, and many historians do just that. But I think we need to push further. So let's consider dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction in the wake of the Constitution's ratification appeared in two modes, a practical mode and a mystical mode. The practical mode of discontent revolved around a concern that the people we're not really in charge of the new federal government. Many people called anti-federalists had argued against the constitution in the first place because they said it would curtail access to the levers of power. Numerous individuals during George Washington's first presidential term subsequently contended that Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton's policies were elitist and therefore out of touch with the people's will. The other mystical mode of dissatisfaction appeared ironically in the monarchical ritualism surrounding George Washington as president. Washington was of course incredibly popular because of his military leadership during the American Revolutionary War, but the cult of Washington took on more elaborate royalist overtones in the first few years of his presidency. To give just one example, if I can turn the page, people celebrated Washington's birthday in the same way that colonists prior to the American Revolution celebrated the birthdays of kings and queens. Now, what this tells me is that the ritualism of monarchical sovereignty remained as 
if not more emotionally satisfying than the apotheosis of the people in the constitution. Unlike the constitution, a complicated and legalistic document, Washington provided a human and therefore readily accessible exemplar of national glory. A population long conditioned to monarchy still hungered for a tangible expression of sovereign authority. In that sense, Washington's popularity did more than suggest that old monarchical habits die hard. It also pointed to shortcomings in the charismatic or mystical capacity of popular sovereignty as expressed in high-minded constitutionalism. Whether expressed as criticism of the federal government's inaccessibility or as Washingtonian royalism, political dissatisfaction between 1789 and 1792 stemmed from unfulfilled, heightened expectation. Burgeoning American revolutionary enthusiasm for the supremacy of the people produced an anxiety regarding the fact that the version of constitutional popular sovereignty being institutionalized at that very moment did not feel as authentic, compelling, or exalted as it should, or as they thought it should. In both versions of discontent, there was a longing for more tangible participation of the people in its own sovereignty. The practical and mystical modes of dissatisfaction did not carry as much sway as they might have between 1789 and 92 because they had glaring weaknesses and they were not conjoined. Criticism of limited access to the national government was insufficiently interwoven with monarchical ritualism to attract a large following. The monarchical ritualism surrounding Washington was repugnant to those who prided themselves on the American revolutionary rejection of monarchy. Dissatisfaction between 1789 and 92 with the Constitution's version of popular sovereignty constituted a necessary precondition for, but not a sufficient stimulus to dramatic change. The political alchemy or chemistry or recipe required to catalyze and fuse these two modes of discontent had not yet materialized. But that alchemy appeared with the republicanization and the militarization of the French Revolution. The French Revolution began in 1789, but its impact on the US was initially rather limited. That changed in late 1792 and 1793. In August and September 1792, France effectively declared itself a republic. In January 1793, French revolutionaries executed King Louis XVI on a guillotine. No longer was the French Revolution a struggle over hmm, which type of constitutional monarchy France would become. Instead, the French Revolution was now a much starker conflict between monarchy and aristocracy on one side and popular sovereignty on the other. In addition, from the spring of 1792 through the spring of 1793, revolutionary France went to war against numerous royal dynasties. The onset of war between anti-monarchy France and most of monarchical Europe meant 
that French revolutionary conflicts spilled into other countries, including the United States. Keep in mind as well that declaring and waging war was one of the monarch's traditional prerogatives. When French revolutionaries representing the people went to war against most of Europe, they were appropriating for themselves a vital privilege of monarchy. The French Revolution of 1792-93 thus provided for Americans an inspirational and impactful model of the people assuming and exercising its sovereignty. And now we come to democratic sovereignty. The sense of anxiety, the sense of disconnect that numerous Americans felt between 1789 and 92 regarding the fact that popular sovereignty did not feel as it should prepared them to experience French revolutionary events as a series of epiphanies, as a series of aha, light bulb moments. The out of the blue invention of the American Democrat um, that was at the beginning of the lecture between 1793 and 95 is clear evidence of this widespread epiphany phenomenon. People did not gradually evolve into American Democrats, nor did people methodically reason their way into a democratic identity. Rather, political and military events associated with the French Revolution jolted them into an abrupt realization that they were Democrats. This democratic self-discovery was experienced in the same way many people experience religious conversion as a miraculous overnight transformation from an old identity to a new one. The explosion of democratic self-identification coincided with an explosion of newspaper mentions of sovereign people phrases. This graph shows the relative frequency of references to sovereign people phrases in American newspapers between 1763 and 1795. As you can see, there are some mentions of terms such as sovereign people or sovereignty of the people right around the time the UK recognized American independence, 1783, 84, and 85. And there are a few mention of sovereign people phrases in 1788, the year the constitution was ratified. But the graph clearly shows that mention of terms such as sovereign people jumped in the early years of the French Revolution and then exploded into much more frequent usage between 1793 and 1795. The overlap of sudden democratic self-consciousness and this unprecedented surge in newspaper mentions of sovereign people phrases suggests that the invention of the American Democrat was part and parcel of the creation of a new version of popular sovereignty. At the heart of that new version of popular sovereignty was a yearning to experience the people's sovereignty in a way that evoked or rivaled the exaltation of feeling associated with monarchy. To be a Democrat meant owning and embodying popular sovereignty with a self-aggrandizing arrogance and brilliance that kings and queens were known for. 
To be a Democrat was to declare oneself the new monarch on the block. Some newfound Democrats brazenly discussed the sovereignty of the people in straightforward monarchical terms. In February 1793, a Philadelphia general advertiser author argued, the monarchs of the old world form a center around which the governments revolve. The people are here the center of the system toward whom everybody ought to gravitate. They, the people, are the fountain of power and the representatives are but emanations from them. Just like James Wilson in 1787, this general advertiser author used monarchy derived terms such as fountain and emanations to cement the idea of the people as the new sovereign. But unlike James Wilson, this 1793 general advertiser author was primarily concerned with celebratory rituals rather than constitutional theory. Most of the space in this newspaper essay was devoted to an attack on royalist celebrations of Washington's birthday, not because festive rituals were necessarily bad, but because the sovereign people and their genesis in 1776 should be the sole object of celebration in the US. And this is what the author explained. As the people is the monarch in a republic, the living principle without which it cannot exist, if rejoicings are to obtain, the people should rejoice at their own birth. July 4th is the day which gave them liberty and leveled the Bastille of tyranny. Numerous Americans were apparently thinking along the exact same lines as this general advertiser author. As a number of historians have demonstrated, the French Revolutionary Era was the period when the 4th of July took root as a national holiday. And more broadly, various scholars have shown that the years 1793 to 95 witnessed an unprecedented wave of popular festivals, the vast majority of which were held in honor of French revolutionary military victories. These pro-French revolution festivals were the occasion for thousands of celebratory toasts and many of those toasts were offered to the people. As I mentioned earlier, the very first toast to the people were offered in 1788 in association with the ratification of the Constitution. This graph shows that between 1793 and 1795, there was a greater and more sustained surge of celebratory toasts to the people. The French Revolution of 1792-93 elicited a heightened feeling of the American people's sovereignty, such that self-reverential toasts in honor of that sovereignty became commonplace. What practical effect did this heightened feeling or, expect, or experience of the people's sovereignty have. There were numerous consequences for traditional politics, for elections and party politics. And I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A part of our time. But for now, I actually want to revisit the general advertiser author and dig even deeper into what we might call the politics of gesture, the politics of identity formation, and the politics of status interaction. According to the general advertiser writer, there is a certain dignity of character which every Republican ought to possess, a certain reverence for himself 
which if properly cultivated would give him his just value in the scale of things. For me, the key word in that sentence is ought. Americans ought to possess a certain reverence for themselves, but apparently they didn't always do that. Um, sometimes the people debased themselves by participating in royalist adulation of President Washington. It is as if this newspaper writer is saying, for crying out loud, you are a democratic sovereign, start acting like one. Evidence that many people were intuiting a need to start acting like a democratic sovereign is abundant. In the same month that the general advertiser essay appeared, another Philadelphia newspaper shared this story. A member of the old American company of comedians in a late dispute with one of the managers at New York declared himself a Democrat and that he was determined to reverence no man a whit the more for being arrayed in regal robes. In this short anecdote, we see the intertwining of flamboyant democratic self-identification and the assumption of a defiant demeanor that ipso facto rebuffs genteel expectations of deference. The simultaneous explosions in the mid 1790s of democratic self-identification and assertions of the people's sovereignty thus entailed a paradox. Only by thinking of themselves as persons of exalted status did champions of the people acquire the regal bearing necessary to establish and enforce equality as the foundational doctrine of democratic self-rule. Only by making claims to a vernacular version of noble entitlement did the people learn to put opponents of democratic equality in their place. The craze for the term citizen exemplified the democratic attempt to enact a colloquial version of noble entitlement. As numerous historians have argued, the rage for the term citizen in the mid 1790s signified an anti-aristocratic assertion of equality. At the same time, the term citizen was explicitly used as a title of honor, as a mark of distinction bestowed upon individuals by the sovereign people. Pro-French Revolution Americans referred to Citizen Bradley or Citizen Jones in almost the exact same way someone might refer to Baron von Steuben or Lord North. The crucial difference was that in the mid 1790s, the term citizen was the only title allowed by the sovereign democratic people in their reign of equality. The title of citizen radiated democratic honor at the same time it marked as dishonorable anyone who clung to older titles such as Duke or Earl. The democratic title of citizen was an anti-title title. In conjunction with the Haitian Revolution, which was inextricably linked to the French Revolution, the mid-1790s democratic craze for the title of citizen provided fuel for free Blacks' long-term efforts to fight discrimination and command respect. A spate of recent wonderful works has shown that free Blacks in the decades between the American Revolution 
and the Civil War often fought for equal status by performing their entitlement to what one historian has called the elevated status of citizen. In the mid-1790s, for instance, a number of free African Americans took it upon themselves to march in pro-French Revolution parades. And there is also indirect evidence that some free Blacks used the title citizen to address each other. More than half a century later, in 1853, a convention of free Blacks in Rochester, New York asserted that we would be understood to range ourselves no lower among our fellow countrymen than is implied in the high appellation or title of citizen. Free Blacks appropriation of the title of citizen was forceful, so much so that one historian has recently argued that self-conscious white supremacy was a response by various white Northerners and Southern enslavers to African-American claims to full citizenship. A majority of those who promoted self-conscious white supremacy belonged to the Democratic Party, which means that the transition from monarchical sovereignty to democratic popular sovereignty was double-edged. One long-term consequence of the mid-1790s preoccupation with democratic entitlement was free Blacks dynamic embodiment of the high appellation of citizen. But another long-term consequence was the 19th century Democratic Party's escalating investment in the sovereignty or supremacy of white people in the idea that being white was a badge of distinction akin to a title of honor. All democratic marks of distinction from the 1790s onward drew sustenance from an unavoidably moralistic and monarchy derived understanding of social order and individual identity. King James I of England put it this way, kings are justly called gods because they alone are endowed with the godlike power to grant titles of nobility, to exalt low things. The sovereign's divinely ordained exclusive right to confer titles of nobility meant that the persons so honored were bearers of God's favor and goodness. Non-elites caught impersonating a member of the title nobility were occasionally charged with the biblical crime of blasphemy, with the grave offense of showing contempt for the Almighty by faking a God-given and monarch-granted identity. Democratic titles such as citizen thus expressed a claim not only to vernacular entitlement, but also to intrinsic virtue, to essential rather than behavioral goodness. Critics quickly perceived and mocked the moralism of democratic identity. In 1803, Boston newspaper writer complained, take the most abandoned wretch the world knows, grace him with the title of Democrat, and poof, he becomes sacred. Democratic claims to divine favor descended directly from the idea that the king or queen was the image of God. The abrupt invention of the American Democrat reflected a monarchy-derived yearning for a sacred political order based on the sovereign people's highest degree of excellence. The religious dimensions of democratic identity are with us still today. If I asked all of you right now to grab a pen or pencil and write down one thing 
that is undemocratic, my guess is you would write down something that is bad or unjust. In contrast, we almost always use the term democratic to describe something that is good. The unavoidable moralism of our usage of democratic terminology is at the heart of what I call the spell of democracy. We can scoff all we want at people in the past who worshiped at the cult of monarchy. But our moralistic assumptions about democracy suggest that we are under a different spell. The spell of democracy blinds us to our moralistic assumptions about democracy. The spell of democracy blinds us to the intimate familial relationship between monarchy and democracy. Only by developing an historically nuanced understanding of the abrupt invention of the American Democrat can we break the spell of democracy and see with fresh eyes our current political culture, its late 18th century founding, and the distinct, albeit interrelated, impacts of the American and French revolutions. Thank you very, very much.